better than that. Come on. Good evening. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this evening in the 2023 program for the Mercy Douglas uh, Hospital uh, memory. Uh, we started this program many years ago uh, with the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania, which is the local society of the National Medical Associated Association, founded in 1895, when black doctors were not allowed to join and were denied membership in medical societies that were present at that time. So in 1895 in Atlanta, Georgia, 12 black doctors got together and formed the National Medical Association. And again, I would say that um, the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania is the local society of the National Medical Association. MSCP has for many years sponsored this recognition of our forefathers. And I think about that as I think about the poet James Baldwin said, know from whence you came. And if you know from whence you came, there is nothing that you cannot do in the future. So this is in recognition of uh, black doctors forming medical institutions, the Mercy Douglas uh, Hospital in Philadelphia. You will hear more about that later. So the recognition ceremony over the years was sponsored by and conducted by the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania. Some few years ago, uh, the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson joined in the uh, ceremony and joined in the program. And then more recently, two years ago, the College of Philadelphia Physicians joined the effort. And I am so pleased to welcome everybody to this beautiful building, the uh, College of Philadelphia Physicians. So thank you to uh, the college for uh, allowing us to and to share with us in this beautiful building tonight. So at this time, uh, we are beginning our program and I would like to welcome to the podium, Dr. Andrew Chapman. Dr. Chapman is representing uh, the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson and Jefferson Health. He is the director of the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center and the executive vice president for oncology services at Jefferson Health. So at this time, Dr. Chapman. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And on behalf of the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, I want to say that it is an incredible honor to participate in today's events. We had uh, hosted Dr. Frederick today for Grand Rounds, and it was actually an amazing video learning. And so I only expect that this evening is going to continue that way. So quite, quite a wonderful, quite a wonderful time. Also, um, an exciting time for us for the Cancer Center today in that after decades of support of the City Kimmel Cancer Center to eliminate uh, cancer disparities in the city of Philadelphia, in the region, and nationally, I'm happy to report that Dr. Edith Mitchell has been promoted to the Enterprise VP for Cancer Disparities. So, welcome. <laughs> We are honored and thrilled to have her. So I will uh, move the program along, and I want to uh, introduce Dr. Mira Irons, who, as you know, is the president and CEO of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Dr. Irons, thank you. Good evening again. On behalf of the College 
College of Physicians of Philadelphia. It's my great pleasure and honor to be with you tonight and for the college to co-sponsor this important lecture and to see all of you in person this year. I met a few people on <coughs> virtually last year, but it's great to see you all in this space. For those of you who aren't as familiar with the College of Physicians, it was founded by 24 physicians in 1787 with the mission of advancing the cause of health while upholding the ideals and heritage of medicine. Today, our fellowship has grown to over 1,200 physicians and leaders in medicine and public health. But the college has many things to many people. It's really a unique organization. Um, it's the home to the Lunar Museum, the historical medical library. The library actually is to your right. Um, as you leave here, the library will be open during the reception, so please go in there and see some of our treasures and also our outreach programs, including the History of Vaccines website, and most importantly, to many of us, the many youth educational programs that we have here for the Center for Education. I wanted to take a minute to talk about our youth educational programs. The programs are aimed at high school students from historically excluded communities, girls from the African diaspora, and LGBTQ youth, and focus on encouraging interest in STEM education and fostering careers in healthcare and medicine, with the ultimate goal of diversifying the healthcare workforce. In your program, you'll see a little leaflet that talks about a new program we have this year that's really focused on young black men. It's named the Hinkson Holloway Mentorship Program, named for the two first black fellows of the college. Dr. Edward Holloway and Dr. DeHaven Hinkson were each admitted to college fellowship on October 7, 1952. Both were prominent Philadelphia physicians who made substantial contributions to health and medicine while breaking down racial barriers. The program aims to nurture, inspire, and prepare young black men as the next generation of healthcare leaders and will be and will provide targeted instruction and experience coupled with near peer mentoring um, provided by black male medical students. So we're doing this with the University of Pennsylvania Medical School um, under the direction of one of our trustees, Dr. Horace Delisser. And I don't want to embarrass her, but the inspiration for that program is a young woman that's sitting in the back, Sarah Lumbo, one of the teachers in our program. She, um, she was in the first program. As a high school student, she was in the first cohort of one of our high school educational programs. And when I came here, I said, what could I give you if I had to give you anything? What do you think we need? And she said, a program for young black men. And so one thing led to another, and we're in a pilot phase now. So if you, they're, they're trying to recruit people, there's an information in the program. If you, uh, if you know of anyone, please send them my way. Um, the only other thing I'd like to um, have you look at uh, bring your attention to this on the way out. You may have seen it on the way in, but on the way out, we have the original charter of the Mercy Douglas Hospital. It was in our collection. It, we actually developed a facsimile of it um, to protect it and also to frame it, and it's there with a picture of Dr. Moselle. So I will stop talking now, and um, we'll move on with the program, but we're honored. We're honored to have you here, and we're honored to, um, to host this important lecture. So it is my um, honor to now introduce you to Reverend Miles, who will give the invitation. So Dr. Mitchell quoted James Baldwin, but I'm going to quote Atlantic Star. For those who don't know, it's an R&B group from the 70s and 80s. One of their biggest hits was, when love calls, you better answer. And I'll say this, when Dr. Mitchell calls, you better answer. And so to that end, we thank you. Let us bow. Lord, even now we thank you and we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for the gathering and the reason that we're gathering on this evening, Lord. Lord, we lift before you initiatives that are new surrounding our young men of color. We thank you, Lord, for the young scholars that are represented on today. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep them, strengthen them, and encourage them, Lord, for the world ahead. And Lord, we thank you for 
medical pantheons that sit before us. We thank you for the trails that they blaze. We thank you, Lord, for all that has been done to make way, to make room. And so, Lord God, I thank you for the healers that are under the sound of my voice. And I ask, Lord, again, that you would keep as only you can. Lord, so much has been and so much is yet to come. And so, Lord, we place it all at your feet, Lord, so that everything that is said, everything that is done, is done in such a way that brings you glory and brings you honor. We thank you, Lord, for we understand where we end with our limitations, the gift of science and understanding. You begin. And so we thank you for the signs and the wonders and the miracles that we have seen, Lord, that just remind us who we are and who you are in our lives. So we ask, Lord, that you would just give glory for yourself. We thank you. We love you. It's in the strong name of Jesus that we do pray and do say amen, amen, and amen. My honor to introduce the president, Dr. Shabazz. She's the president of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I want to share with you a brief history uh, that marks the reason that we're joined here today. Since 1982, the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania has celebrated the legacy of the Douglas, Mercy, and Mercy Douglas Hospitals with our annual <coughs> Mercy Douglas Lectureship. The reasons for the establishment of these hospitals are the same as those that sparked the establishment of our parent organization, the National Medical Association, exclusion from white professional spaces. One of the worst legacies of slavery was the criminalization of learning. While in the late 1800s, recently freed blacks could be taught to read and opportunities for higher education were expanding, the educational and professional pipeline in medicine had a major block in the line, systemic racism. Refusing internship training to African-American medical school graduates was just one of the ways that health inequities were made persistent. Limiting full access to educational and professional opportunities ultimately disadvantages communities that would be served by those professionals. The Mercy Douglas Hospital originated from the Frederick Douglas Hospital founded by Dr. Nathan F. Moselle Moselle was the first African-American graduate from my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, in 1882. Despite this accomplishment, Dr. Moselle was not allowed to complete residency training at the University Hospital due to his race. He had to cross the Atlantic Ocean to receive this training in England. His dedication to black and poor people of Philadelphia led him to return, inspired to create a hospital where black people would not only have access to proper medical care, but would also have access to training and career opportunities in nursing and medicine. Frederick Douglass Memorial Hospital and Training School, Philadelphia's first black hospital, was founded in 1895 in a three-story building at 1512 Lombard Street. Funding for the hospital was provided by the black community and some wealthy Philadelphians. Another University of Pennsylvania Medical School graduate who was denied postgraduate training is Dr. Eugene Henson. In 1907, he, along with several other physicians from the Douglas Hospital who had become dissatisfied with leadership, opened the doors of Mercy Hospital in 1907. That hospital shared a similar mission of providing access, training, and professional opportunities to Philadelphia's black community. As we have observed in recent times with the closing of several hospitals right here in the city, both Mercy and Douglas hospitals struggled financially, in part due to their mission of serving patients regardless of their ability to pay. 
In an effort to preserve both hospitals, Douglas Hospital merged with Mercy Hospital and School for Nurses in 1948 to form the Mercy Douglas Hospital in West Philadelphia. And you can see the charter just as you came in. If you missed it, please be sure don't miss it on the way out. The charter, which has been restored and uh, replicated for your um, viewing in the main central entrance. Um, the combined entity of the Mercy Douglas Hospital continued to provide health care, jobs, and training to thousands until it closed <coughs> in 1973. 2023 marks the 41st year since the annual Mercy Douglas Lectureship was established. This year, we are extremely honored to have the president of the Mecca, Howard University, to serve as our lecturer this year and provide his insight on the state of diversity in medicine. So without further ado, I'd like to bring back Dr. Edith Mitchell to introduce our speaker. for that um, great discussion of um, the origin of Mercy Douglas Hospital that we are celebrating here tonight. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Wayne Frederick is the 17th president of Howard University and the distinguished Charles R. Drew, <coughs> Professor of Surgery at the Howard University College of Medicine. And he is also a practicing cancer surgeon at Howard University Hospital, where he continues to see patients and perform surgeries. Uh, Dr. Dr. Frederick is really a true son of Howard, having entered there and having received three different uh, degrees from the university. BS, oops, BS in 1990, MD in 1994, and an MBA in 2011. As president of Howard University, Dr. Frederick has worked and demonstrated his leadership abilities by expanding not only Howard University School of Medicine, but the entire university. He is an expert in surgical oncology as well as healthcare disparities, and he votes, devotes his time in working with not only leadership and the growth of Howard University, but also for many other uh, institutions as well. He is a member of a number of surgical and medical associations, including the American Surgical Association, the American Cancer Society, the American College of Surgeons, and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wayne Frederick. Good evening. I'd like to thank, uh, first of start with Dr. Mitchell to thank her for her generous introduction. I'd like to meet that guy one day. Uh, I said, the, uh, I'm humbled uh, to be here with you. I think uh, the time in history that we're living in uh, for our country, this is one of the things that I think is going to be extremely important for the strength of the country as we move forward. Because as this issue goes, in my humble opinion, uh, so does America grow and grow. And so I think it's a, it's a critical opportunity. I do want to thank um, the hospitality um, in Philadelphia. Every time I come to Philadelphia, I feel like I fall in love with the city all over again. And I've been coming here uh, quite a bit. I'm a commissioner for the Middle States 
uh, crediting uh, Buddy as well as uh, the board directors of the American Cancer Society. So I'm, I'm here uh, quite often. What I'm going to do uh, tonight is try to give you a talk on my perspective about the state of diversity in, med in the medical profession, but also hopefully give you some encouragement about things that we can do um, in spite of that. And I know that nobody wants to talk about this today, but um, let me assure for those of you who might be feeling a little down tonight, um, I'm a supporter of the Washington Commanders, so uh, you, you guys are in a much better situation than I am. So it's all about perspective. So this issue is near and near to my heart. I want to start with this slide here. And while this might be difficult to read, I'll, I'll draw your attention to what I want you to, to focus on. If you look at the line with the black or American only um, applicants to US medical schools between 2019 and 2022, you'll see something very remarkable happen in 2021, 2022. What happened there was we had a significant increase in the number of black Americans who applied uh, to medical school. A welcome increase, an increase that I will talk about a little further, but it went up as high as 21%. Um, that, a couple of things I think were factors there. One was the pandemic that certainly spurred a significant interest um, in so many young uh, black Americans who saw the big disadvantages that were occurring in our society and wanted to participate in closing those gaps. There's a similar rise in the interest in other medical professions such as nursing, etc. But what I would then draw your attention to is in 2022 to 2023, you'll see that that number quickly went back down. And so one of the concerns that we do have is despite that significant increase, it was not sustainable. Just the very next year, that number went down. We are also concerned about the retention of those students throughout their matriculation in medical school and then what happens to them with respect to residency. So something for us to keep our eyes on, but something that you'll hear as a recurring theme uh, throughout my talk. There are only about 5% of the doctors in 2018 in America were black, and this is also a significant concern. And it's not that every black patient needs to see a black physician. But every black physician has an opportunity to ensure that the medical profession is more culturally competent. And that is really the key issue for why you need more black physicians, because you need to make sure that the sensitivities around providing care to those who may be in an underrepresented group, um, there's some sensitization to that. If you look at the number of active um, residents in training by race and ethnicity, again, you see uh, similar things, 6.1% are black and African American as well. Now, there's a projected shortage um, by the AAMC. I actually like to use this chart because I'm always curious as to why the scale of this particular chart goes all the way up to 140,000. And I'll tell you, they, they consistently do this. And I know every time my team asks me to alter the slide, I, I tell them not to because I think they do try to make a point. And that point is that we live in a country with 300 million people. So just to put it in perspective, if you live in a country with 300 million people, you probably need 140,000 surgeons in order to provide care in rural areas, in big urban cities, etc. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we have about 30,000 is where we're projecting based on our current system, and we're probably going to end up with about 15,800. So that shortage is a concern in terms of that gap that is going to continue to potentially grow. So what specialties do our students at Howard and other African American students go into? And one of the things that we're seeing in terms of trends um, is lifestyle and how lifestyle is impacting the choices. And those lifestyles of the choices, those lifestyle choices that students are making, whether it's students of color or otherwise, are very similar. Um, anesthesiology is a very popular specialty. Um, and when you talk to students, they'll tell you. Now, preoperative, uh, there's, no, there's not a heavy load of seeing patients um, necessarily preoperatively. There's no maintenance of a clinic setting. Uh, there's no maintenance of a practice in terms of long-term follow-up, etc. Uh, very defined, um, in most cases, depending on the practice you know, you're in, very defined hours, etc. Same thing with emergency medicine as another example. Numbers of general surgery, however, are continuing uh, to fade away, and that's a concern. 
So why is this so concerning to me? Um, when I became president at Howard, I initially made a slide um, as I was giving this talk that identified the fact that in 1978, there were more black males who matriculated to our medical schools than in that year, 2013. And now, there are more African-American males in our medical schools, but by percentage, the number is still less than it was in 1978. So you just heard a very incredible history of what has happened to providing care in this city, what black physicians did back in 1906 and 1907, and then culminating in the closure of a very important institution in the 1970s. So think of what has happened just here in Philadelphia between 1978 and this year, and the fact that we have by percentage less medical students who are black males entering uh, for matriculation. So we have a crisis. We certainly have a national crisis that needs to be paid attention to. As I pointed out on one of the previous slides in 2021, the number of black males increased significantly in that fall class. That number went up some 21%. And I would speculate to you that part of the reason for that was no travel, people being able to get Zoom interviews done, and a sensitization nationally because of the pandemic and the disparities that were occurring, as well as the murder of George Floyd. And I think we have to um, be frank that that awakening, as I like to tell my students at Howard, that caravan to social justice was joined by many people. That caravan probably has never been swollen in our contemporary history in America the way it was swollen then. But what I would also tell you, as I told my students back then, when that caravan was swelling, is the caravan will also lose those participants very quickly. And the key is that when they leave, we have to make sure they leave us with gas, new tires, carburetor, etc. because ultimately, where that caravan is going to that summit of social justice must be undeterred. But it does require long-term commitment and focus. And just as you see an increase in medical students of color um, go away in just one year, we're seeing that across the board in almost every aspect of social justice. In 2019, the giving for social justice issues was completely annihilated in 2020. The spike in giving towards social justice issues was incredible. I think every week for probably six months, we heard of some corporation that was dedicating another 500 million, etc., to a cause related to social justice. I'm here to tell you today that as we stand here today, the giving for social justice issues is less than it was in 2019. So that has already dissipated. People are focused on inflation. They focus on several other things that we know will always grab their attention unless we keep the spotlight on some of these issues. So what are some of the factors that are limiting this? I want to start by talking about a study that was done. And I, earlier today when I spoke about this, I mentioned the most altruistic human beings, in my humble opinion, that you will find anywhere in America today are first year medical students the day before they take their first class. <laughs> and that, those are probably the most altruistic human beings you will find. They will do anything you tell them because they are here to cure medicine, cure disease. They are here to do whatever it is that's necessary. Johns Hopkins School of Medicine did something that was very ambitious. For the entering classes of 2013 and 2014, they were asked to take a web survey, which included an implicit association test looking at race and social class, eight clinical scenario opinions, I'll show you one of them, and direct questions regarding explicit race and socioeconomic class preferences. Now, I have to be honest with you, I think this was one of the bravest things I've seen a medical school do. Because, remember, we interview these students, we feel that we pick the best and the brightest, but we also feel we pick the best of our human condition. The hypothesis here was that, like the general population, doctors may possess unconscious or implicit biases that may lead us to not unknowingly treat patients differently. I always tell my 18 and 16 year old this, that 
Doctors are no different from the rest of society. The only difference is that we see the human condition in peril on a more frequent basis than everybody else. And that can either make you a better person or it can make you a cynic. And so you have to be prepared mentally and emotionally when you decide to become a physician. The objectives were to identify the presence of unconscious and implicit race and class bias among first-year medical students and determine whether that bias affects their clinical assessment of surgical patients. This is one of the clinical vignettes that they use. The black male in this picture is a lawyer. And the white male in this picture was described as a tool booth operator. And the question that was posed is this. Of these two individuals, who is more likely to read, understand, and sign an informed consent? And the answer overwhelmingly, by the most altruistic group of people that you would find, before they took a single medical school class, was the white tool boot operator. Overwhelmingly. So the point is that when these two people were to come into the hospital and be seen, despite their occupation, we would be approaching them as a medical profession from two different apertures. We would see the black lawyer as less capable of understanding information we provided, making a judgment about signing a consent, and then signing it confident. We would think that the white tool boot operator was more capable of doing that. What was interesting, and I, I won't go into all the details, but there are a couple of interesting points to know. If you look at those students in the survey, there were 211 total participants, 202 completed the entire survey, 52% female. That's very representative of our medical school classes across the country today. Um, overwhelmingly white, as you would expect, a significant number of Asian American students as well, and a 6% uh, of African Americans. The age distribution, as you would imagine as well, uh, people who've recently left undergrad education and are coming to our med school, so a very young population as well. And as I mentioned to you, I have an 18 year old and 16 year old, I will tell you, they are way more altruistic than we are. As cynical as we are about young people and their phones and etc., they are way more altruistic by any measure you take. If you look at any national survey that's done on young people age 25 or younger, they are far more likely to be empathetic about others who don't look like them, live in the same country as they do, etc. And a lot of that is because of information they have. But I do think that they're probably less cynical uh, than we are at that point. And you can see, when you look at explicit versus implicit race preferences, overwhelmingly the preference was white uh, for, this, for this group. Now, what's interesting is the implicit racial preferences are present, but these do not appear to affect clinical decision making. So there's hope in the story. And that hope is that if you take those medical students and put them through a rigorous curriculum that exposes them to these I would say, to, to these pitfalls that can occur, you have an opportunity to sensitize them so they don't make those types of judgments just based on how a patient may present. And just to put an even sharper focus on that, I have sickle cell anemia. When I travel, I drink water copiously. My biggest fear anytime I travel is getting a crisis outside of D.C. Because I could show up at almost any DC hospital and somebody would recognize that that's where in Frederick is the president of Howard, they've heard my story, so they know if I say I have sickle cell and I'm in dire pain and I need pain medications, so it wouldn't be an issue. If I were to get sick tonight in Philadelphia and go to any emergency room, I would not go without Dr. Mitchell. Yeah. And that's just a fact. And that's because I would have to spend time convincing someone that I am not participating drug-seeking behavior, right? And that's just a reality, and that's a reality I live. So I just want to be clear, even as the president of Howard, this does not miss me for any reason because I'm in a three-piece suit. That's not the case. The case is 
when I leave home, I, the last thing my wife asks me is, do you have Motrin in your bag? To ensure that I have some bridge until I can get hydrated, etc. Water and Motrin are the last two things that I must ensure are in my luggage, even on a short trip like this as well. So, the conclusion is that a majority of medical students exhibit an unconscious bias between whites and the upper social class. And unlike data on physicians, these biases do not impact the assessment of surgical patients. And I think that's important because I still think that young people have a formative opportunity when they come to our medical schools, if our curriculum is rigorous enough to talk about this issue more openly and to make sure that we are giving them guidance as to how to manage this. Now, the implications obviously are that further studies are needed. I want to switch gears a little bit to talk a little bit about Howard and its impact on that diversity. Howard is an interesting place. It was founded on March 2nd, 1867, signed by federal charters, the only HBCU that was founded by the federal government, bringing it into existence. The 17th president of the United States, President Andrew Johnson, signed the charter that started Howard on March 2nd. The same day, he vetoed the first Reconstruction Acts. And for those of you who know your American presidential history, um, he probably was selected as the Vice President of the United States as a compromise by Abraham Lincoln. He was from Tennessee, and nobody anticipated that Abraham Lincoln would be assassinated. So at the time, it seemed like a good idea. Upon his assassination, it wasn't such a good idea. That signature that he placed on Howard's charter, which sits in my, which is one of the items that sits in my office, led to the creation of an institution that would give rise to the first black female vice president of the United States in Kamala Harris. I mentioned that. <laughs> I mentioned that because especially for the young people today, I don't want you to be cynical about what is happening in America. We have a messy democracy, but it works. And it only works because we participate. We must participate. And it is messy. I will not deny that but it works because we all participate in some way, shape, or form. When Howard was founded, it was an ambitious event. It was right after the Civil War, and they decided to create an institution as a university. That's one of the first things that people sometimes often miss. Most of the American medical school, um, American universities were created actually as seminaries. Howard is one of the few in that time period that was started immediately as a university. Very ambitious. Just a couple of years after, um, a college of medicine was started, which also, you think about back then, was very ambitious. And this is a picture of the first faculty. The gentleman all the way to the left, seated, is Dr. Augusta, a black physician. And the gentleman second from the far side from him is Dr. Purvis, uh, who was a surgeon at the time. So two black physicians were on the first faculty of Howard University back in 1871. So the other thing about this very ambitious institution, unlike most of these institutions that were started back then, is that it, was, it involved black faculty very early on, which is one of the things that I think made Howard a very, very different place. A little known fact is that I am only the seventh black president of Howard, and there have been 17 of us. So there have been 10 white men who've been president of Harvard University, right? And those are defects in our culture that I don't think we sometimes want to acknowledge. Harvard University sent a black woman to the White House before it sent a black woman to my office. That's something that we have to own, and you'll see how I own it later in the conversation. So the Flexner Report. In the early 1900s, Abraham Flexner, was given a task to go to every single medical school in North America, US and Canada, to assess it. And what was he assessing? He was assessing the entrance requirements and the adherence to them. He was ass assessing the size and the training of the faculty. He was assessing whether or not um, undergrad education was part of those requirements, or what the rigor was like, etc. He was looking at the, the fact of the, instru the construction space, uh, the facilities, etc. When he was done, his conclusion was that 
we had to reduce the number of physicians who were training because they were being poorly trained. And so, as a result, there are several things I saw in this when I decided to read it. And when I say decided to read it, I mean I got the original Abraham Flexner report and I read the entire thing. And these are some things that I pull out for you to take note of. He wrote in there, and this, these things I'm, I'm reading just as I saw them written in there. It is clear that women show a decreasing inclination. The seven medical schools for Negroes should be reduced to two. Blacks being a potential source of infection and contagion needed their own physicians. Hygiene rather than surgery should be strongly accentuated at those schools. As a result of his report, by 1923, only two medical schools that were in existence for blacks would remain. Between 1920 and 1964, that legacy would live on such that less than 3% of students entering American medical schools were black. And that percentage has barely budged up until 2021 and is now back to almost that same percentage. So we've had a long lasting history of this. So like you, I know that what you're thinking about Abraham Flexner, just based on what I just said. But let me give you another two facts about Abraham Flexner. I become president of Howard and I go into Howard's Moreland Springer and Research Center to look up the prior trustees like Frederick Douglass, his original writings, and guess what I find? Abraham Flexner was a member of Howard University's Board of Trustees from 1930 to 1936 and would go on to become the chair of the board between 1932 to 1935. So one thing I hope you leave here with tonight is that this prior slide that left me with a clear conscious bias of Abraham Flexner without the context of the time and space that he was operating in was equally erased by this slide when I discovered that he then went and spent all this time at Howard University and their board of trustees. The other thing I found out is that the only medical school he felt that should remain in DC was Howard University. And he wrote that in his report that Georgetown University Medical School should close. As you can imagine, I never say that when I'm in DC, but I'm in Philadelphia, so I can say that. So just to show you that while he was harsh, about the black medical schools, he was also willing to say that only one medical school should remain in DC, and that was the black medical school. Now, the growth of Howard really became the contemporary Howard you hear about because of this man, Mordecai Wyatt, 40 year old Baptist minister. Um, any Morehouse men in here, um, he was a Morehouse man and was the first African American president of Howard University. One of the reasons there are only seven black presidents of Howard thus far is because he stayed for some 34 years. As a, as a result, today, the university has 14 schools and colleges, has a TV station, a radio station, we have our own hospital. It is a very, very complicated um, place, and with an enrollment now approaching some 13,000. I happened to meet a dermatologist, uh, Lilia, who was speaking. So uh, when I met her, I said, great, I have my dermatology slide in here. Howard University is responsible for 80% of the black dentists in this country, either because they attended our undergrad, our medical school, our training program. 80% of the black, dent black dermatologists. Now, while we may pat ourselves on the back, that's dangerous to me, that we rely on one institution this much to diversify such a field. And that's just one example of the many things that I think Howard University does that we need to be careful about, I think, as a nation. So when you look at the enrollment at Howard University, you'll see, and I'll talk a bit about that diversity. So as I said, we have close to 15,000 students now as of last fall. These numbers were from the fall before. There are a couple of things on this slide I would bring your attention to. One is, the fact that the biggest reason Howard students do not graduate on time is because of finances. And second, you will notice that there's a green line at the bottom tracking um, a three-year graduation rate. And that's because of my own bias that I think we should have a three-year undergrad program in this country as part of our management of student debt. And at Howard, we have exactly that. You can take 20 credits a semester, 
so you can graduate in three years. Almost every undergrad major now has a scheme um, that gives you a three-year option. And while we talk about student debt in the context of a six-year program um, in the government, I think that that has been a mistake. I think we have to talk about it in a different way. So at Howard, if you graduate in four years or less, we give you 50% back of any tuition that you paid for directly in your last semester. And that's the incentive to make sure that people are graduating on time or early. You pay less if you graduate one year less, you get money back. So if you were going to take out a ten thousand dollar loan and you decide to, you know, pay us five thousand in cash, we give you back twenty five hundred at the end of the semester. We get you out into the workforce earlier or on to the next thing that you want to do earlier. And I think that we have to start approaching the student debt issue from a different place. But look at this slide. Why do you think we have few black males in medical school? Because 74% of my undergrads are women. And that's a fact. And so when we look at pipeline, the pipeline is getting tightened much further downstream than we recognize. So going to recruit males, black males especially, to medical school and undergrad is too late. There's not enough of them um, to do that. The other thing I would bring your attention to is our top three majors last fall, biology was number one. So we have on any given day at Howard some 800 to 1,000 biology majors on my campus. Right, so we have students there that have an interest, but I'd point your attention to the fact that political science is number two. The year before it was number one, and prior to that was probably not in the top five. But the other thing I'd point out to you is that what happens in this country influences our young people. And after the Trump presidency, political science became the number one major at Howard University. And as you can see, it's number two. Today, I just signed a letter of recommendation for a student at Howard who wants to be a White House scholar. She's a biology major, but she wants to be politically active around the issues about maternal health care and black maternal mortality. And so I think it's extremely important that students stay connected and that our medical schools accommodate that connectivity that those students want. Now, selectivity is an issue. If people are going to apply, fewer people are going to get accepted. We have to look at that issue as well. And it's no different at Howard. We now have the fifth most selective med school in the country. As you can see, we get close to 9,000 applications. We only enter a class of about 126. But what I would challenge you with is this, and I think this is one of the things that makes us different. 79 of the first year students at Howard, Howard who enrolled in fall 2021, were not accepted anywhere else. Howard is the only place that they can enter. And so you can be selective, but you can apply rules around that selectivity that allow you to fulfill your mission. That actually is gonna be very important because the Supreme Court's case about affirmative action is going to bring this issue full front and center. We have a secondary supplemental application that all students have to pull out, and it asks some basic questions around your willingness to serve in an underrepresented um, area. That's the question that we ask. And based on your answering of that question, we engage you in the interview around that particular to, tell, to decide whether or not you will come to Howard and go out into the world and do what you need to do. We've had a white male at Howard come to us from the Naval Academy who was interested in sickle cell and went to Malawi and Tanzania to do a full bike. The only medical student in my entire tenure that I have met who took time out of med school to go do a full bike and it was on sickle cell research and that was his focus. And yes, Howard was the only medical school that he got into. So if you look at that single acceptance issue, it's not just Howard. Nationally, 58% of students are accepted by one school only. Right? So that's also another interesting thing. We talk about physician shortage on one hand. On the other hand, we talk about very, very high selectivity. And now we may sit back with our hubris and say, well, we only want the best and the brightest. I would challenge that. I would challenge it to suggest that I'm not sure that we're necessarily getting the best and the brightest, and that's the only reason why our selection, selectivity is so high. Right? No, no, I'm not suggesting that we go open a medical school 
on every corner. But what I would suggest is that we have to, as a national issue, fund medical education and to have it be more expansive than it currently is. And to even rethink how we make it available uh, to more students who are interested. The pandemic clearly impacted what we do, what we did. And I think this is an important inflection point for us as a country. The life expectancy of a black male who lives in Ward 7 and 8 in DC is 20 years less than a white woman in Ward 3. DC is no wider than six miles. The difference between Ward 3 and Ward 7 and 8 is about roughly three miles. The capital sits squarely in the middle of that distance. And yet still, in the nation's capital, the life expectancy of a black male is 20 years less than a white woman who lives in a different ward. So we don't have to go far to find issues to rally around. We have significant issues around how people are living, the nutrition they're getting or not getting, and what we must do to intervene around these issues. The pandemic just simply brought that to light for a wider part of our society. But the reality is that these numbers have been like this for some time and required intervention. I'll give you another statistic of interest. While Michelle Obama was in the White House as the first lady of this country, Black women were far more likely to die in childhood in Washington, D.C. than they were to die in half of the African countries that we always want to look at and assume are going to provide a lower level of care. So while we thumb our noses, the facts of the matter remain that a black woman is far more likely to die in Washington, D.C. than in many countries in the United States. As a matter of fact, a black woman in D.C. is far more likely to die in childhood than in 48 states in our country. One of them is Alaska, where access is an issue. Because you may live very far away from a physician. But in Washington, D.C., with all these hospitals, a black woman is far more likely to die giving birth to a child than in some 48 other states in this country. So we definitely have an issue that we have to address. Improving the diversity in medical school enrollment, in my humble opinion, is critical. And you saw what happened with that increase in 2021. We've been lauding that increase, but I'm very concerned that it has gone away already. So it's something that we have to look at. One of the things that has made a big difference to us already is a philanthropic gift that we received from Bluebird. He gave $100 million to the four historically black medical schools to pay off $100,000 worth of debt for medical students who qualify for that, uh, for that gift. What we immediately saw were medical students beginning to make a different decision on Max Day. Medical students who were deciding that I'm going to go into that subspecialty that I didn't think I could get into, such as neurosurgery. How many of you can see on the fifth floor of the hospital a hospital that I have been in and out of since 1990 has a hallway with a picture of every black neurosurgeon. I've been walking that hallway since, 1980, since 1990. I know the face of every black neurosurgeon in this country because of that hallway. One hallway at Howard University Hospital has the pictures of every black neurosurgeon. The dean of my medical school is the first board certified black female pediatric surgeon. We're in 2023, and I hired a dean who was the first woman to be board certified in pediatric surgery. She applied three times. She attended Dartmouth Medical School. She was persistent, and thank goodness she was. So these disparities we have are significant. This gift is now allowing students to make choices they wouldn't make, where they may go and do their uh, residency, the type of residency they may choose, all of which ultimately will help us close some of these disparities. And these gifts are significant because if you're a freshman medical student, you got 25,000, 
the year that we first got the gift, and you'll get 25000 every year to offset that. And that is going to allow these students to do different things. Also, help create generational wealth, which is a very critical factor in this. So it's not just about that one medical student. We have to think about the ecosystem that that then builds. My mother is currently visiting with us in Maryland. I have three younger brothers who live in the area. Um, she, we lost our stepfather last year. I stand here before you as the president of Howard. I sit on four corporate boards. I sit on the Federal Reserve Board. I have no clue about my mother's finances. And I have no mechanism to find out about it anytime soon. <laughs> right? She will turn 78th in October, and if I even initiated that conversation, she would bring a quick end to it. <laughs> my kids and my wife and I meet every New Year's day at the dining table, and we have lunch, and we discuss our finances, the family's finances. We open the books and go over every single dollar and cent that I have. What my boards pay, what my salary is, we discuss every single thing. The first three years we did that, my kids were probably five and seven. My wife cried the entire night after. It was painful talking to your kids about your potential debt. It was painful, I'll be honest with you. The last time we had this discussion, which was this last month, my son was saying to me, why do we have to wait until 23 to make our own decisions? What if I wanted to go backpacking? How quickly would the money get to me? Are these counts um, accessible in such a way that the day that you die, I can go use a card and get the money out? <laughs> I started to get suspicious, right? But the point is, the very conversation that I could not have with my mom, my kids are very comfortable having it. That's not to say that they will be wealthy, but they are aware. And I think that it is important that we make our generation and the next generation at least aware. We have to get more comfortable having those conversations. And I'm telling you, I'm going to go back and tell my mom I gave the same talk. I said the same thing I always say, and she's going to say, good for you. <laughs> now, the pandemic, like I said, really changed our workforce strategies. A couple of things that we have to recognize. Where are we going to get these students from? Well. HBCUs are responsible for 34% of African Americans who get degrees in STEM disciplines, bachelor's degrees. So who is going to go to medical school? So one of the things I would ask anyone looking to diversify their medical school is how many HBCUs are represented in your medical school? At Howard, when I looked at this issue, only four HBCUs were represented in my 452 medical schools. And that's a problem. because if those are the students who are getting the degrees. It means that we're not recruiting in the right places. The other thing that I would say is you should look at who, which undergrad institutions are sending students to medical school. And this is difficult to read, so I apologize, but what I'll tell you is African-American students, the number one supplier for medical schools is Howard University. When I started at Howard, we were number two to Xavier. I gave Norm Francis an honorary degree because I told him I am amazed at what Xavier University has done for this country. And he, there's not, there, isn't, there aren't enough presidential medals of freedom that you can give that man for what he did for America in terms of diversifying the health sciences pipeline. Without a medical school on his campus and without a hospital affiliated with that institution, he sent more African Americans to medical school and pharmacy schools than any other institution in the country for decades. And then when I came along, I said, we have to put an end to this. We have a medical school on our campus. We have a hospital on our campus. And so I'm happy to say that Howard is number one. But what I would bring your attention to is Xavier is number two. And just as importantly, when I first looked at this list, there were about seven or eight medic, um, HBCUs on this list. And today, there are only three. So the other thing that we have to be vigilant about is what is happening to those students. They are still responsible for giving them degrees in STEM, but we're not getting them into medical school. And so we have to develop more relationships. The other thing that's an issue is research and getting students into STEM PhD programs. 
our university over the past two decades sent more African Americans to STEM PhDs in this country than Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Yale combined. Right? Stock market didn't do so well today. Those four institutions, their combined endowment is about 165 billion today. Howard's endowment is about 910 million. On its way to a billion will be the first HBCU to have a billion dollar endowment. But think of the burden that this one institution is undertaking in an underfunded position. So we have to be very, very wary of that. So every summer, we bring two students from any HBCU that would send them. I send a letter to all the HBCU presidents. Some of them take me up on it, some don't. We pay for it at Howard. And we bring two students. We give them MCAT prep, DAT prep. We give them clinical exposure. We give them um, lectures. And we also give them a practice MCAT, which we then review the following week to ensure that they have the ability to develop test taking skills. And we have seen their MCAT scores increase. We've seen more of them get into medical schools. While Howard sends more African Americans to STEM PhDs, we did not do that to a purposeful program, which was the other thing that I recognized. And so we started a program, it's called the CAR STEM Scholars. These are the young people in my courtyard uh, who belong to this program. I think a picture tells a thousand words. Every one of these students in that picture is interested in getting an MD, PhD, or a STEM PhD. So when people tell me there aren't enough young people interested in this, I, I, I reject that. We get 300 applicants a year for this program. This is out of high school. And their commitment is they will come to Howard in the summer. They'll take an African American course or a STEM course. They'll go to Berlin, because the other thing that we've discovered is some 75 to 80% of these kids don't even have a passport. So we try to give them a, a international exposure. And every summer after that, they will go to someone's lab and work in a high-powered research lab. Um, what that has that resulted in, the average GPA of these students, all for the majority uh, African-American students, 3.89 GPA. So you can't tell me that, that there aren't young people with this interest. Look at their SAT score combined, 1385. They could get into any Ivy League school in America, and some of them do, but they choose to come to Howard, and we're thankful for that. They do very well. Um, you can see their average GPA for the fall of 2020 was 3.74 for that too. The cumulative GPA as a group was 3.82. And their placement in terms of the research opportunities they go to, you can see here. Harvard, Amgen Scholars, Will Cornell, Gateway to Lab, they participate in several different programs. And this is some of the things they do. They, they write articles in places like Cell, etc. They do very well. This is Jasmine Grant. She was a 2021, 2022 Gold Water Scholar, one of our CAST STEM scholars. Um, extremely gifted. Uh, so gifted that she wrote me a letter to encourage me to start an undergraduate research journal, which is all student run and paid for by the president. Uh, this is Cameron Walker, who um, won an NSF graduate research fellowship as well. So they've been doing very well. This is where the first cohort are uh, attending graduate school um, presently and pursuing their PhD. And you can see the schools on there as well, including UPenn. So these students clearly are extremely uh, brilliant and I think do a fantastic job. But we all recognize that it starts even earlier. So a little known fact is that on Harvard's campus there's also a middle school that's focused on math and science. We call it MS Squared at Howard. 96% uh, of these students who come in um, are actually performing under, uh, sorry, 80% are performing under uh, what we expect them to do coming in with their peers, but about 96% of them end up attending uh, college and about 60% do STEM uh, discipline. We believe at Howard that we have to bring industry closer to what we're doing. And we've tested this in other fields outside of STEM. So we do it in Howard Entertainment, where we send students out to Hollywood and Amazon Studios. We have students from four schools and colleges that are co-taught by our faculty and industry leaders. 
We've done it with something called Holland West, where we've done it with Google, Google engineers, and my computer science faculty teach our students. We do it with all finance now, uh, with a few companies that are exposing students to private equity and venture capital. And I think in medicine, we have an opportunity to do that as well. Dr. LaFall was my mentor. Uh, he had a saying, the patient must be the object of our affection. And I think that that's extremely important. And the reason we must talk about diversity <coughs> in the medical profession is because we have an obligation to take care of every patient to the best of our ability. And if we don't diversify our medical field, we are not going to be able to do that in the next He did not get into the two medical schools that he applied to. He was a graduate of what was then known as Florida A&M College, which would now be known as Florida A&M University. He graduated with one B on his transcript. He was 18, year old, 18 years old when he graduated from undergrad and did not get into Meharry or Howard. He could not apply to any other medical school. 1948. His university president would petition Howard's president, who at that time, you probably figured out what Mordecai Wyatt Johnson to admit him to medical school, the decision he would never regret. He would graduate number one in the class. He would um, go on to become the first African American president of the American Cancer Society, Society of Surgical Oncology, the American College of Surgeons. But why do you think he didn't get into medical school? He didn't take standardized tests well. Sounds like somebody you probably know. But somebody gave him an opportunity and look at what resulted. So the other thing we must be thoughtful of is what is our measuring stick when we look at this. I think there's several things that we can do around community centered care. We currently have our nutritional science students going into um, areas such as Ward 7 and 8 that I mentioned and shopping with the residents there for groceries. They then tabulate what the residents purchase and send it to their primary care physicians. Uh, we have, the students came back and said, you know, this is great that we go into the one grocery in Ward 7 and 8, but we should go into the corner stores. And so now they go into the corner stores. They help the proprietors with where they shell items see if uh, people would make better healthy choices and they actually do. So I think it's extremely important that you know programs like this uh, we continue to push when we look at how we deliver food to those communities. There are food deserts that exist in our major cities and we have to start thinking about how we bring um, those things to patients and meet patients um, where they are. This is a picture that I'm very fond of. Um, the lady who's sitting actually say the lady first who's gone up and, and removing her mask there is Dr. Tina Brown. She's the dean of my nursing school. And the lady next to her is a 104-year-old African-American woman who came to Howard and got a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine, which was administered by an 18-year-old nursing student. And just think about the life this woman would have lived. She saw two pandemics, and in the second one, someone who looked like her, who would never have had that opportunity in that first pandemic to give her a vaccine, gave her a vaccine. This woman said this was probably the happiest day of her life, not just to get the vaccine, but where she got it and who she was able to get it from. And I think that that's extremely important. That vaccine outreach was important. So as I conclude, there are a couple of things I want to show you. One is, you saw that 76% of my undergrads are women. When I started at Howard, one of my deans was a woman. So even at Howard University, where we like to tout the fact that our DNA is social justice, we practice bias. That is only broken if we make an issue of it and we take steps to change it. So if you interview for Dean's position at Howard, the committee you will meet will be gender balanced. All the committee members have to attend unconscious bias training and cultural competency training. So you can imagine the riot that caused with the faculty as well, right? I'm telling my faculty at Howard, the woke institution of Howard, to go do unconscious bias training and cultural competency training. And they go kicking and screaming, and they will come back and say, I'm glad that I did that. I don't interview finalists unless one is a woman. And I tell them, if you can't find a woman to be a finalist, let's start a woman. The one thing you don't want to do when you're on a search committee is to do it twice. So trust me, I'm yet to find a situation where they didn't bring me a finalist that was a woman. 
And these women are very highly qualified. Two of the women in this pick, two of my deans have now been selected as presidents of universities. First time in Howard's history that we've had two women in an academic year be selected to be presidents of other universities. So that pipeline is strong. Excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. I'm the Charles R. Drew professor, and you see Charles R. Drew to the right. Uh, the gentleman in the middle I spoke about, and these are the three people that I always hold up for not just their ideas, but the way that they live their lives, and I think um, the path that they set out for me. The woman to the left is my mom. Uh, she was a nurse for 51 years. Um, my grandfather was a lawyer. He was a school teacher until he was about 42 and decided to go to law school all the way in England. Had to get there by boat and then came back uh, to Trinidad and Tobago and practice law for the rest of his life. He thought that my mom should go and become a nurse. She wanted to become a physician, but he felt women should become nurses. He was a good man. He got that wrong, but he was a good man. So she decided that three of us, of the three of us, she wanted three boys. She was very obsessed with boys. She still is. I have an 18 year old son, and when she comes to my house, it's like I don't exist. Um, she wanted one of us to become a physician, and I'm that physician. So a lot of what I do is because of her. And why Howard? Some people ask me. The first prime minister, Trinidad and Tobago, actually was a political science professor at Howard, Dr. Eric Williams. And she was also obsessed with his leadership and the fact that he came back and decolonialized Trinidad and Tobago. So as far as she was concerned, I wasn't going to school anywhere else as well. The fact that they had a sickle cell center was an added bonus. But as I close, I want you to think about this slide here. Equality, when we think about it in our society today, we think about everybody getting the same support system, not providing any advantages to anyone. And this is a big argument that people make against affirmative action. And this would work if everybody was the same height. And you can relate that if everybody started off in the same place and had the same access, the same resources, we could say, fine, let's just leave the society as it is and give everybody the same support. The reality is that equity can give different advantages to those who may be of different heights and are starting in different places. And that essentially, you could say, is what affirmative action is about. The reason people complain about this is they say, well, the reality is how do you know when you've given enough? And when you do that, do you disadvantage those that you're not giving any to? And that could be a complicated argument. We could be here all night trying to settle that. But I would uh, submit to you to think about in the next few days that the simple way for us to deal with this is to remove the barriers. If we just took away the barriers from everyone succeeding, whatever those barriers may be, finances, public education, whatever you as a society may think those barriers are. And I think we seek justice in anything that we do, I think we'll get there. When I first made this slide, I was telling the audience earlier today, um, this was my closing slide. And you can, if you zoom in on the picture with my daughter, you'll immediately notice that in the background, that's President Obama giving his um, concession speech in New Hampshire, so the year would be 2008. Um, my wife is a computer science, has a computer science degree, and she would look at my PowerPoint slides at that time more for helping me with my uh, terrible looking slides. And uh, she showed up and said, you're giving a talk entitled Unconscious Bias in Academic Medicine, and you're closing with a slide with your son in surgical garb and your daughter looking like a cheerleader. <laughs> so, the last thing I want you to leave here with is to recognize that there's unconscious bias in all of us. And it's not always coming from a bad place, right? My intention when I did this was not to obviously deny my daughter what I hope she would have access to. And so this is the slide that I like to close with now because she actually is interested in becoming an orthopedic surgeon and only operating on high-performing female athletes. So for the men in the audience, um, if she comes to Philadelphia and you hear of a young lady named 
Dr. Kiwi Frederick and you have a broken leg, do not go to her, she will not see you. <laughs> and my daughter is a freshman at Duke where he is on the soccer team and he's doing economics. Um, I took both of them to the operating room uh, two Octobers ago, October 21st, and as I was telling the audience earlier, my daughter was fine. She was like, I'm going to be in here thousands of times. And he got a rush that will never leave him. I got back to my office and he said, I got a rush when you made that incision there. And I just looked at him and smiled because I, I've been there. I got that rush the first time I was in the operating room. So he could do all the economics he wants to do, uh, but it will not leave him. And my daughter plays volleyball. She unfortunately tore her ACL last October, but she's on the men. So now she's really committed to being uh, an orthopedist. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. Lecture and for your outstanding achievements in advancing the cause of diversity in medicine, the members of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania have unanimously agreed to um, welcome you as an honorary member of our society. So. clerkship I did at Port of Spain General Hospital. So, uh, uh, and Trinidad taught me um, more about uh, medicine than um, NK here. So, but today we are here to honor some of our uh, great um, students and student doctors who are coming. Um, we are very excited about this. The background, again, um, in the context 1895, the National Medical Association is established in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1895, my grandfather was uh, in Western Georgia, uh, sharecropping cotton at the same time. But uh, black doctors were establishing an organization where we could associate and practice medicine. In 1907, uh, the establishment of, of Mercy Hospital. In 1948, Mercy Douglas Hospital is the merger of the Frederick Douglass Hospital and Mercy Hospital. And in 1961, the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania um, was established so that the NMA affiliate doctors here in Philadelphia, we could associate um, to extend the ability to practice medicine since the opportunities to practice at Philadelphia General Hospital and Mercy Hospital, those were limited and we wanted to be able to practice and associate in anywhere. So today, we come together to honor two of our uh, great presidents of the Medical Society, um, Dr. Sandra Magruder uh, Jackson, served as the president of the Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Medical Society, the Keystone State Medical Society, affiliated with the NMA. He, she was the longtime Region 2, which is the Mid-Atlantic region of the NMA uh, chairperson. And um, any, anyone who uh, I was around you know, starting here in practice in Philadelphia, and anyone who knew um, Dr. Magruder knew that if you knew her well, you were going to be called to do Physicians on Air, our radio show, um, third Sunday, 2 o'clock, Physicians on Air, every Sunday, WURD. The, the great, um, uh, we're not uh, WHUR, <laughs> which is the, 
dominant radio station in the whole, in the whole city. We are one of the great um, black radio stations in the URD, but our, our show has been on the air for 20 or 30 years. Dr. Sonny Bruder was, a, uh, was the host of that show for decades. And uh, she was our, one of our presidents. Um, and Dr. David Knox was, uh, our, again, now eight years, uh, one of the presidents of the MSCP Medical Society and spent a uh, great time um, reaching out and served um, with the Medical Student Scholarship Program. And so for those years in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, uh, Dr. Gruder and Dr. Knox um, pushed and, and pulled to make sure that medical students um, had that access to scholarship that were acknowledged. And so in uh, 2019-2020, um, the Medical Student Scholarships were Reinstituted as the Magruder Knox Scholarships, and um, if, I don't know if um, Sesha or Iris um, Magruder Jackson, if either of them are here, or if Dolores Knox is here, we, we just wanted to acknowledge them. Um, we don't we don't see them here today, but we um, uh, Dolores is the widow of uh, David Knox, who is a renowned Philadelphia cardiologist, and the Magruder Knox uh, daughters. Um, uh, carry on with healthcare equity and diversity. So today, though, we come to present the Magruder Knox scholarships to five scholars. And so our first scholar is is an aspiring doctor, Tadima Aswago, and. Uh, Chinema is at the Lewis Cat School of Medicine at Temple. She is an aspiring hospitalist with an interest in global medicine. She completed her undergrads at, at Tufts, majoring in African Africana Studies. And she has spent her time in medical school working with community health, race, and diaspora studies, um, which were part of her majors as an undergrad, and, and she has been focused on community-based participatory research, global health delivery, and quality improvement, and anti-racist health equity, reparative health justice, and the colonial, settler colonial determinants of health. Um, of note, she's also a, a, a part owner and currently directs um, Afrobeats in Boston and Afrobeats in Philadelphia, which are um, great dance companies here in the, in the community. So she has really done great things, and we today want to present her with the Magruder Scholarship. But he is an end of life doer. Uh, his interest and compassion for medicine and public health through his work serving aging populations and their loved ones. So his interest has been to help all of us in that transition time that we're all going to have to face one day and our loved ones have to face. He is a third year student at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. His intentions is to go on to be a geriatrician and geriatrician and palliative care physician. So come on up, Corey. Thank you so much. Jefferson University's uh, School of Medicine, and 
was a grad was originally from Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. We uh, acknowledge New York City, and was a uh, grad uh, got a BS in biology at Elizabethtown College, and a minor in psychology, um, and received her master's of biomedical studies at Drexel University. Prior to grad school, she worked as a performing arts specialist at Methodist Hospital for Children here in the city, um, and has worked uh, a, long, a long time with spearheading summer arts programs for foster uh, kids to, I'm sorry, foster artistic and cultural growth in children in our community. She, she worked as a steer, in the steering committee of Jeff Hope, which is the, um, one of the student-run, student-guided uh, clinics to help the underserved community here in, in, in uh, this, this central part of, of the city where Jefferson resides and worked with high school students through the healthcare collaborative program. She aspires to be an oncologist, so Dr. Mitchell, uh, she's, she'll be ready for you. And we'd like to uh, bring her up to uh, honor her. huge population of students that applied. It was a very competitive uh, review. Uh, these students all were about service and giving back to the community. So I'm just so proud for our scholars for this year. Uh, Dr. Shabash is going to come up and give a special president's award to two outstanding students who work with us. So the next awards are being presented to two students who are very special to the MSCP. The President's Award is not one given on an annual basis, but only when someone presents themselves and triggers the honor. And uh, at that time, it's considered upon the recommendation of the Executive Board when a student exemplifies himself through scholarship and dedicated service to the medical and local community. This year, the Executive Board of the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania unanimously agreed that two students were deserving of such an honor. Because of their service to Philadelphians, through their volunteer efforts, their service to their school community, 
including involvement in the SNMA and especially to the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania. I, refer, I affectionately refer to these two honorees as the diamonds we mined on Broad Street. <laughs> Bryson Hoover Hankerson, fourth year medical student at Temple's Lewis Cat School of Medicine, and Coco Coco, third year medical student, also at the Lewis Cat School of Medicine. Bryson, I could tell he was like the Barack Obama of med school. <laughs> he's not only an honor student, having been inducted into the AOA, he's an amazing community organizer. His ability to bring students together was instrumental in the success of the MSCP's recent events, and one of the best connections he made for the MSCP was introducing us to Coco. Coco went above and beyond in her contribution to making our recent holiday party and fundraiser a huge success. Not only is she an outstanding medical student, but she is tireless in her service to the community and has transformed the MSCP's social media presence, allowing us to connect with so many students, residents, and young attending physicians in the area. It is my honor to present you both with the 2023 Medical Society Firstly, thank the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, uh, Center to Eliminate uh, Cancer Disparities for hosting the Medical Society of Eastern Pennsylvania for this wonderful event. And without further ado, I'm going to bring back on Dr. Edith Mitchell for closing remarks. much for participation tonight uh, in this 2023 rendition of the Mercy Douglas Lectureship. Uh, we thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Fredericks, for being here. We thank all of you for being here. And I know there is something in the other room waiting, so I am the only thing between you <laughs> and that. Uh, but I do want to uh, bring Dr. Levin uh, on. Our meeting is closed. I'm closing it right now. But don't go in the other room yet until you hear and see what she has to say. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your time, your efforts. Thank you for the students for being here and those who have worked to uh, contribute to their uh, presentations and their awards tonight. Uh, we always want to make sure that we are reaching back to the next generation of black doctors in Philadelphia. So, down and the males in the back. Uh, but this is only about eight minutes. Charmaine, do I just push the arrow forward? In the face of Jim Crow and overwhelming odds, many African-American physicians and nurses were still able to obtain a medical education. Due to the color of their skin, many were denied residency training or staff privileges to provide the highest quality of care to the African-American population that they served. In the year 1895, the year of Frederick Douglass's death, the Frederick Douglass Memorial Hospital was established by Dr. Nathan F. Moselle at 1512 Lombard Street. Dr. Moselle, an 1882 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, was refused an internship to the University Hospital 
despite his recorded exceptional academic accomplishment. Because of the racial politics of that time, he completed his training in England and returned afterwards to Philadelphia. By 1900, roughly 40 black hospitals were established in the United States. Between 1891 to 1902, there were 10 black nursing schools, and by 1930, nearly 200 black hospitals were built. In 1948, the Frederick Douglass Hospital merged with Mercy Hospital, another prominent black hospital, to form the Mercy Douglass Hospital. Leading off with the fact that I was very proud of that hospital and the doctors that served the community. Uh, it wasn't an elitist thing at all, but well-trained, giving doctors. And the fact that not only they gave to the community, but they gave to each other. And that was a very pleasurable part of my experience with them. The little informal gatherings in the hall and Dr. Edward Holloway, who always seemed to be the uh, chief speaker, so to speak. We all listened to him. He knew more about, he was an internist, but he knew more about pediatrics than I did, and I was a pediatrician. Exceptional person, but point being that he sort of gathered us together, uh, uh, pulled things out of us that perhaps we didn't know we knew, and so we all learned from each other, and that was one of the best parts of being in that hospital staff. And other hospitals that I belong to you walk by and say, hi there, and you're going on. Uh, at Mercy Douglas Hospital, it was almost a continuous learning procedure. Despite the fact that we were in the shadow of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, and that shadow stayed there for the most part, that we were able to fight our way through it and above it. Coming from Washington, and having had some of my training in Freedman's Hospital, which also was a black hospital, even though associated with Howard University, uh, it still was a black hospital in a segregated city. So uh, I was sort of already marinated, so to speak, to be able to work in those conditions, but at the same time, not accept them, but to continue to try to break through those barriers and to be on an equal, and in many cases, above the normal in terms of degree of the medical services that were available and were given freely. I got into graduate school at Howard University and I was going to, you know, go into zoology. I had a project, uh, the vitamin E effect on a six-week-old chick embryo and some little crazy stuff like that. And that that's the direction I was going. Uh, one day I'm in the <clears throat> laboratory and I'm just fitting around looking through the microscope at egg yolk and all that stuff and feeling very discontent, but Dr. Drew walked by and he was always curious if he saw someone in a study situation. And so he poked his head in, uh, he just called me Gaskins. Uh, what are you doing there, Gaskins? Uh, and of course I came straight to attention, Dr. Drew was an icon. And so uh, I said, well, Dr. Drew, I'm working on a project for, for my bachelor's degree. And he said, well, tell me about it. I said, that the effect of vitamin E on the six-week-old chick embryo. And the minute I said it, I said, that is a stupid sounding thing to be doing. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden he looked at me in a way like he felt it was too. <laughs> And uh, he looked in the microscope uh, because he was very curious intellectually. And he said, well, good luck. And when he got to the door, he turned around, he looked at me and he says, I believe I heard uh, in the registration department that there was one more opening in the freshman medical school class. And out he went. I said to myself, why did they tell me that? And it was like one of those light bulbs that you see going on so that you start thinking clearly. I said, he was trying to tell me something. <clears throat> and the next day I went to the medical school registration and said, listen, if you have any openings in the freshman class? One last opening and bring us some credentials and we'll see what we can do. And so within three days I was registered as a freshman in medical school. When I think of Dr. Lorenzo Walker, I think of someone that I have admired for years for many reasons. <clears throat> Personally, a, a, a person that was friendly, giving, uh, and uh, quietly intelligent. 
he assumed a position uh, almost uh, single-handedly of publishing uh, a magazine which uh, became uh, much sought after by local physicians and later we found out that that magazine was looked at as far as California. Uh, he uh, was very modest about it but very thorough about it and even today I consider him among my closest and most admired friends. This particular procedure, which was called exchange transfusion, had just been more or less successfully developed in Boston. It was uh, something that kind of elevated me in a way above just office pediatrics. And uh, a number of exchange transfusions were successfully done. And uh, I, was able, I even wrote an article that appeared in the Journal of Pediatrics concerning it. I did not originate, it's just that I was taught how to do it and uh, was able to bring it into Mercy Douglas Hospital where it had not been done before and it uh, was received quite well. That's one of my fond memories of my professional exchanges, so to speak. And when I look back on it, I'm proud that I was those doctors that I can remember that gave the best possible care and when unrecognized, uh, were still able to be able to give everything that they had learned and been taught so that the community, particularly the community of color, uh, received care equal to that of any hospital in the city. to the history of black medicine in Philadelphia. Dr. Gaskin unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He was a mentor and a pillar to this medical community for all of us. And we thank him for his years of service and dedication to black health care in Philadelphia. Dr. Frederick uh, wants to take a picture of all the Howard alumni in the room. So if you guys can come up and the rest of you can uh, proceed to the reception area and the hall.